Let's turn to page 7. I go for a page until I'm invited to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the accumulations of the practice of giving and so forth, may I be converted to the Dharma and the Dharma and the Beings. I go for a page until I'm invited to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the accumulations of the practice of giving and so forth, may I become Buddha to the Dharma and the Dharma and the Beings. I go for a page until I'm invited to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the accumulations of the practice of giving and so forth, May I become a Buddha and pray to be all sentient beings. Come here, children, so be children, so be the minute of mantra. All phenomena arise in the process, the causes of our practice are the situation of Just as the previous mantra which we sang. Um, so here, Atiyataum Gade Gade Parakade Parasangade Bosom. In English, it simply means, Here is thus, or Go, go, go beyond, go still beyond, and establish your enlightenment. This is me. Meaning that where we are now, this is a place of misery. It's a place which is undesirable and there is this ultimate source of happiness within you ultimate source of happiness within you where there's no fear where there's no uh, depression there's no stress there's no say the undesirable things ultimate source of happiness whatever you experience is just blissful and joyful and that is the body swaha so the, from the state of where we are now full of miseries. From there, we have to go to this experience of the Bodhiswaha, the ultimate bliss. So how to go? We have to go to that level, to that state, in five steps. These five came to be known as the five paths to traverse, to his Buddhahood. So, Gade, Gade, 
Father God's day, Father Son God's day, Buddhist so or this fine. And what this fine thought? Part of accumulation, part of preparation, part of seeing, part of meditation, part of normal learning. So this we have to study more in depth. So here as we recite this, imagine that our very compassionate <coughs> teacher Buddha Shakyamuni, he exhorts us that don't stay in don't don't stay in this misery. Don't stay in samsara. Come out of samsara, come towards the ultimate happiness. And as you hear this melodious voice of the Buddha Shakyamuni, our very compassionate teacher. You inform this to your two kind parents, to all your family members, and to all such beings. Look, this is what very compassionate teacher Bhagavad is exhorting. Thus, not to say in samsara, why should we be in samsara anymore? Why should we be suffering anymore? Why should we have fear? Let's all go towards perfect happiness, where misery is unheard of. So with this inspiration that you give to all dear Muslims and beings, then you imagine that you are taking all the dear mother and things along with you towards the ultimate happiness. Okay, if you can do this as we recite this mantra, this would perhaps this would be the greatest gift that you can offer to your uh, to kind parents. This would be the greatest gift that you can offer to your family members and all dear mother and things, and above all, the greatest gift that you can the offer to all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Because finally, what all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas they want is that you are happy, that you are not suffering, this is what they want. And since that you are doing this not only for yourself, but for all the sentient beings, what greater gift can we think of to offer to the and Bodhisattvas than this incredible great gesture of reciting mantra and taking everyone towards this enlightenment. Now the next point, how does reciting this mantra take you towards that state? So that will be studied. Um, that, that we have to know the concept of independent origination, which we are going to study after this recitation. Okay. <clears throat> if, imagine that you are leading this and all sentient beings are joining you towards full enlightenment, towards ultimate happiness. <laughs> Okay, Trivers to Sultan of Happiness. 
whereby your happiness is never stirred by any external conditions. Whatever conditions that you may face with, your happiness is never stirred. So if this is what is to be achieved, the next question is, how can you achieve that? This is the next question. This is the next question. So, um, okay. At times I may be, at, at times I may go into little rational thinking. Make sure that you pay attention to these. Pay attention to these. And page 52. Page 52. <coughs> Okay. Um, I pay special attention attention to this. I say finally, we're happy or unhappy. It's your mind which decides whether your mind is happy or unhappy. And your mind, if it goes haywire, and then your mind is unhappy. Whereas if your mind is very peaceful, settled, then you say I'm happy, right? And then who decides whether the mind is whether the mind goes haywire or whether the mind is peaceful, settled, not affected by external conditions, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So what decides that? What decides that? Okay. In the dreams, say you are in a very cozy bed, and your mother is you are a very young girl or a young boy. Right? And then your mother is just watching you and you are fast asleep. You go to bed, oh my mother is next to me. There's such a joy there. And then you start dreaming of a ghost. Dream of a ghost and a ghost is chasing you and the mother is watching you. From your body language, the mother will see that you are having a nightmare. Right? You're having a nightmare. So your mind is very unhappy. There's so much of fear in you. What creates the, the fear? There's mental turbulence there. Mental turbulence is there. What creates the mental turbulence? It's because you have created a perception which is very scary. So we see that your perception, your perception is responsible for triggering a set of emotions, a triggering a set of feelings. When the perception is very disturbed, like ghosts and so forth, then a very unpleasant feeling is triggered. So you do you want to escape from this unpleasant feeling. And you think that this can be done through running away from this ghost. Right? Okay. So then when you're on the verge to shout, your mother wakes you up. And you realize that you're in the very cozy bed next to your mother. No need to be afraid. Right? This is what you realize. You realize that because you wake up, you, you are awoken. You have awoken. Because of you become awakened, then the fear dissolves. Because you come to know, know that perception which happened earlier, that is simply created by your mind. The moment you come to know that the perception, very scary perception which came to your mind, that was simply created by your mind, is not coming from the object. That you realize when you wake up. You realize when you wake up. So when that perception stops, then the corresponding unpleasant feeling stops. The, the feeling of the fear stops. Right? So this is what is meant by waking up from the sleep of ignorance. Okay, with this in mind. We see that finally, finally, someone, you as someone seeking total freedom, you as someone who is seeking total freedom, total freedom or total happiness, total peace, is through waking up from the waking up from the control of your dream. Right? So when you start dreaming. Who decides the content of the dream? How many of you are going to go to bed today and tonight 
I said, oh, tonight I will have a dream of meeting with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. <laughs> or meeting with the Buddha Shakyamuni. How many of you were going to decide that? No. Then who decides your dream? Right? You don't have the choice. You don't have the choice. When you don't have the choice, when you go to sleep, sleep signifies a body's ignorance. So this ignorance creates this dream, and then you fall prey to this, right? You fall prey. Now what do you do? What do you do? If you don't want to, if you don't want to fall prey to this sleep of the ignorance, wake up, wake up, and listen. All these the dreams, even though pleasant dreams. How many of you want to have the pleasant dreams? Everybody wants to have it. Even the pleasant dreams, you don't have the choice. You should have the choice. Even with the pleasant dream, the element of your lack of freedom is there. You did not decide the pleasant dream. You don't have the choice to select the pleasant dream. Sometimes it happens, sometimes the bad dreams come. You don't have the choice. Even with the pleasant dream, there's the element of the freedomlessness, lack of freedom. Right? How to gain the total freedom? Wake up from the sleep. Wake up from the sleep. Then all the dreams, involuntary dreams coming in you will stop. So waking up, it is for this reason that a compassionate teacher Buddha Shakyamuni, one of the epithets by which the Buddha Shakyamuni is addressed is the fully awakened one. The fully awakened one. Right? Okay, bodhi, fully awakened one. So in this connection, the awakening, awakening from the slave of ignorance, this is what our very compassionate Buddha Shakyamuni wants all of us to, wants all of us to experience this awakening from this type of ignorance. Once that happens, then all these miseries which come to us without any choice, they will all stop. They will all stop. Okay, so this is the main practice. This is the main practice what for the Buddha Shakyamuni idea appeared on this earth to have the sentient beings, each one of us. And of course, this concept of waking up from the sleep of ignorance, to see the reality as it is, to see the reality as it is. So this concept of seeing the reality as it is, um, today in modern science, we see that physics tries to, to see what the reality is. What the physics, chemistry, biology, they all speak about Neuroscience, they all speak about the objectivity, the need to be very objective without being influenced by the subject element. They try to see the, the objective reality, and particularly in the context of quantum physics. Quantum physics. Um, so they try to explore what is the objective reality there in the absence of the observer. In the absence of the observer. Then they speak about how, in the absence of the observer, the observer makes no sense. There's nothing there, it's object there in the absence of the observer. Independent of the observer, there's nothing there. And likewise, reality with the concepts by Albert Einstein. So we see that what they're trying to explore is what is the objective reality there, what is ultimately there. Likewise, the Buddhist Shakyamuni said, wake up from this type of ignorance. You have to see the ultimate reality. And then with the moment you see the ultimate reality, you are not under you are not in the hands of the ignorance. The moment you wake up from this type of ignorance, all all the offshoots of the ignorance, ignorance, attachment, afflictions, gotamic karmas, the miseries, they will all stop automatically. When the root is cut, the stem, the stem will dry. When the stem dries, then the, the branches will dry, dry. When the branches dry, then the, the leaves will dry. Then the, the flowers will all die. The poisonous leaves all will die. So, <clears throat> For this, we say finally, um, uh, the purpose for our very compassionate teacher Buddha Shakyamuni to appear on this earth is to, just as he's awakened, he's awakened, he wants each one, each one of us to be awakened, not to give in to this ignorance, the sleep of ignorance. So, to how to wake up, or how not to give in to the ignorance? By introducing the light. Ignorance is like darkness. In dark, you don't see anything. Ignor with ignorance, you don't see the reality. In dark, you don't see what is the air. So ignorance is like darkness. 
So to overcome the darkness, it is only done through introducing light. Likewise, to overcome the ignorance, the darkness of ignorance, it is only done through introducing the light of the wisdom. The next question, what is the light of wisdom? So by the very definition, the wisdom, wisdom is a discerning mind whose, appreh whose apprehension of the object tallies with the reality. Wisdom is a discerning mind whose apprehension of the object tallies with the reality. The next question, what is the reality? Okay, so with this, with this, to explore what the reality is, the author of the text, the author of the text which we are studying today in praise of dependent origination, the author of the text, the text Lama Tsunghapa, perhaps in Tibet, perhaps in Tibet, um, he, 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 he is one of the Greatest, greatest literary, literary giants of Tibet in, four, in 14th century AD. 14th century AD, the author of Amazonkarpa. So, he was so much into this, but he was so famous, and he was a great practitioner, and an incredible great scholar. Then, he was studying about this, out of what constitutes out of reality, and he was reflecting on it, he was meditating on it, and then, at one point, he started to get some inkling of what experientially he would experience, experience something. Experientially, he was getting some form of the experience of the reality. What comes to ultimate reality? Because the wisdom is, de wisdom is defined as any discerning mind whose apprehension of the top object has with the reality. What's the reality? So this, the author was exploring, exploring through studying the Buddha's own teachings and the great commentaries by Amy Master, such as Aranigarjuna, Ajara Chandra, and so forth. And then at one point, at one point, and he himself being extremely sharp, and at one point, he started to get some inkling experience of what constitutes his ultimate reality. So he wanted to double check. He wanted to double check the experience that he was getting, whether it was the real experience of the ultimate truth as taught by the Buddha Shakyamuni or not. So for this purpose, Okay, Ari Manjushri here. Ari Manjushri here. This is the Buddha of wisdom. Buddha of wisdom. So, um, there was one teacher by the name Lama Umapa. Lama Umapa, who, who used to have a direct vision, direct vision of this Ari Manjushri, the Buddha of wisdom. This Lama Umapa, he, used, he can communicate with Ari Manjushri directly. Directly, and the Aramajushri is a Buddha of wisdom. And then, whereas Lama Tsongkhapa, Lama Tsongkhapa, the author of the text, at that point he did not have, he, he could not have the vision of Aramajushri. So Lama Tsongkhapa made the request to Lama Umapa to please double check with Aramajushri, the Buddha of wisdom, to see if his experience of emptiness, the ultimate reality, uh, tallies with the, tallies with the. Atma reality as set forth by Buddha Shakyamuni. Then, Aramajushri sent a message saying that um, your experience of emptiness it is not. It does not tally with the uh, with that of the, the what the Buddha Shakyamuni taught. So um, then, the then then Arimanjushri, the Buddha of Wisdom, he sent a message with some advice, saying that, but this the Lama Tsongkhapa, this great saint, if he follows, if he fulfills three three factors, three conditions then he would very soon realize the ultimate reality as taught so clearly as taught by Buddha Shakyamuni. What are the three conditions? One, one, that he should, that he should, that he should engage, engage in the, the activities of purification and purification, purification of his mind and, and accumulation of merits. 
he should engage in the practice of the purification of the mind and accumulation of merits. One. Then number two, he should he should study, reflect, and meditate still more. He should study, reflect, and meditate even more intensely on the basis of the great commentarial works of the Indian masters on ultimate reality. He should study, reflect, and meditate even more intensely on the concept of ultimate reality as on the basis of on the basis of the commentarial works of the great Indian masters. Number two. Number three. Number three. He should make fervent prayers. With these two things intact, he should make fervent prayers to his guru to be seen as to be seen as to be seen as one with the with the Buddha. One with the Buddha. With these three things things intact. With these three things intact, then he will very soon realize emptiness so clearly as initial taught by the Buddha. So it is on this basis that Lama Tsongkhapa, he left for solitary retreat, solitary retreat, and he stayed there for 11 months, exclusively doing these three things, exclusively doing, doing these things. And then, just at the end of 11th year, then he had the initial, clear, crystal clear experience of emptiness. Crystal clear experience of emptiness. Then on this basis, he started to, 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 to scribble his experience, his experience, and he was so fascinated. Amazing, this is ultimate reality. If somebody sees this, if somebody somebody sees this ultimate reality, there's no room for miseries to arise. All miseries will dissolve. So everybody should see that. And who taught this amazing? with a very deep, very profound experience of emptiness, ultimate reality. The Buddha Shakyamuni taught him, he's such a great teacher. He's such a great teacher. Then he just jotted down his experience, his awe and admiration and respect, adoration to the Buddha Shakyamuni on the spot. So this writing came to be known as Impressive Dependent Origination, which we are studying now. Okay, so therefore it's very auspicious on the one hand, we are doing this teaching in TBC, Tibetan Buddhist Center, which is which um, Jibala, then Vini, then Wenla, and then all our wonderful volunteers here. Um, so somehow they connect so many people to almost like what today can be seen as the, the, the Buddha of 21st century, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. We are very fortunate that we are all here in TBC, which is directly connected with the office of His Holiness Dalai Lama. And then we are doing this text, which this great same scholar realized emptiness, ultimate reality, as taught by the Buddhist Akimani, as directed by the Buddha of Wisdom, I mean, usually. Okay, so uh, we are very fortunate. So with this in mind, let's turn to page 52, Sans of One. Um, he who speaks on the basis of seeing, this makes him an over and teach an unexcelled. I bow to you, O conqueror, you who saw dependent origination and taught it. Okay, so uh, some of you are big, the, uh, coming here for the first time, and many of you were here since, you are here since um, the, since about <laughs> a month ago, a month ago, right? Okay, in May, since May. Oh, it doesn't matter. So let me make a very quick here. Let me make a very quick here. Let's say, um, we are talking about the ultimate reality. We are talking about the ultimate reality. To know what exactly is ultimate reality. Okay, uh, say, um, say, um, okay, <coughs> Um, Buddha narrated this story. The Buddha narrated this story in order to explicate what is ultimate reality. Um, there was a king, and the king invited a painter. Invited a painter to paint something because he was he was so curious. He was so 
I started to see a lot of painting. He invited the best of the painter, best of the painters in his um, the kingdom, and he was given space and the all the facilities to paint. And then after the painting, the king was so happy that he it rewarded the painter with whatever. Then the painter left. Then after about two years, again the king wanted to king wanted to um, the, this thought of the painter came back to the king. And again he wanted to invite the painter, invited, and showed him the same place and asked him to paint another something else. And the painter going there, entered into the house and came out shouting, There's a ghost there, there's a ghost there, there's a ghost there. And came out shouting in great fear. And the king became so unhappy. What happened? There's no there should be no ghost in my palace. Then he sent his ministers to see what's there. And there's no ghost at all. There's no ghost there. Right? There's no ghost there. Only there was a painting of a ghost. <laughs> painting of a ghost was there. And then this painter, this painter, he painted this ghost two years ago. <laughs> he forgot it. And he painted it so real. Now today he forgot it. He painted it, he forgot it. Now he said that, and this painting scared him. Right? So, this painting actually came from his own mind. He painted it. It came from him. And he forgot it. And he saw that as so objectively real. And then that started to scare him. Right? So, likewise, the Buddhist Akhamana, a very compassionate teacher, says that everything is like the painting which was painted by the painter himself. And forgetting, having forgotten that this painting was painted by himself, then he saw that as so cut off, so real there, and it scared him, it frightened him. Likewise, all the miseries that we see in our life, all the miseries that we see in our life, they're nothing, they're nothing, they're like the play of our mind, like the dreams. The dream goes, who created, who sent the dream goals to you to scare you? Who sent the, the dream goals to scare you? Who sent it? Huh? Your own mind. <laughs> Your own mind created the dream goals and then that scares you, right? Nobody sent it to you. It's your own mind which created the dream goals and then it scares you, right? It frightens you, then you start running. Okay, so this is exactly what the Buddha said, that everything that you experience is nothing but a play of your mind. The moment you discover that, the moment you discover that, Without discovering that, it is like saying, in the dream, you are saying that don't worry about this dream, don't worry about this ghost, this ghost is just a dream. In the dream, if somebody says that, you will not be convinced. <laughs> when will you be convinced that this is in my mind? When will you be convinced? Only when you wake up. So therefore, in the dream, there's no point just saying that this is just your dream. Right? So you have to wake up. So this text, which we are studying, what for the Buddha Shakyamuni appeared on this earth is to tell us, is to teach us how to wake up from the sleep of ignorance, right? Okay, so now, from this what we are saying is that, that in actuality, everything comes into being by dependence. There's nothing independent existent. Everything comes into being by dependence. One, everything is like dream. Two, Right? Just as a dream comes into being by dependence on the mind, everything comes into being by dependence, dependence on three factors. Just as a dream comes into being by the power of your mind, everything that exists in this universe, whether your own, own food, the house, your friends, your parents, your car, the heart, the, the nation, or the international, everything, the stars, the moon, Right? Good experience, bad experience, everything is just a play of your mind. And yet, unless you wake up, this word remains a word. These words remain an empty word. Right? You have to wake up. Now, at least for the, the, the time being, we have to learn something. We have to learn it on the intellectual level. Then subject it to reflection. Then to meditation. Okay, with this, so everything comes with being by dependence. Just as a dream comes into being by dependence on mind, everything else, even in the waking state, everything else comes into being by dependence on three different factors. One, 
dependence on causes and conditions, one. Number two, dependence on parts. The table, table comes into being, but depends on its parts, say the top plank and the legs, and the table is made of, the table is made of millions of atoms, and none of the atoms are table, right? None of the atoms are table. And how many of you, how many of you have eaten bread in your life? And the bread is made of millions of atoms, and none of the atoms that you ate is a bread. 100 percent is true, right? None of the atom which you ate is a bread, right? So we see that yet the bread comes into being, but depends on these atoms which are not the bread. So therefore, these atoms are the parts of the bread, not the bread. So things come into being by depends on the causes cause and conditions. One, things come comes into being by depends on the parts. Like the bread depends on the atoms which constitute the 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 bread. Number two, then number three. Things come into being by dependence on the mind. Things come into being by dependence on the mind. Right? Okay. Okay, let's say that let's say that <coughs> um mother 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 sees the neighbor's child, mother sees the neighbor's child, not mother's child, mother sees the neighbor's child. A neighbor's child who is very naughty, mischievous, very active. And this child is so naughty. The mother will describe the neighbor's child as very naughty. And if her child is equally naughty, she will see it very differently. My child is very active. <laughs> <laughs> then the mother sees the, the neighbor's child as very passive and very slow, passive, right? And if the, the mother has the same child, very passive, slow, the mother will describe the neighbor's child, very passive, very slow. Right? And her child, she said, my child is so gentle and soft. <laughs> right? The perception. Perception. It's the same thing. Same thing, but when it comes to others, children, the same, the same lady sees that as something negative. But the same quality which your child has, this is as active or gentle and soft. So your perception, which makes the difference? If you as the third person looks at this, this way, you same. Either very passive or very active. Or very mischievous. Same. But the mother sees this way as different. What makes the mother to see this way different? The mother's mind is making it. Yes, no? Yes. Okay. I remember... <laughs> When I was a child, age six, seven, and particularly age eight, nine, ten, there, when I look at my father, my father is so handsome. <laughs> yeah, 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 so handsome. So perhaps if I were to choose my father and Richard Gere, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I would choose my father as my handsome. I would, I would rate him. I would rate him as you know, smart. Yeah. Wow, he's something so different. He's just amidst, say, 20, 30 people coming in. My father stands out. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing handsome. Then when I was age 16, 17, my one of my aunties, my one of my aunts, uh, who was very close. Uh, the connect, they related to my mother. Then I was in her house, and then she was sharing the her childhood time with my mother, and was telling about my family. And she should, Norji, your father, including him, there were seven siblings. Yes, I know that seven siblings, and of the seven siblings. Your father is the most ugly one. <laughs> I could not believe it. This young boy was seeing him comparing with Richard Gere. And all the other, my aunt was saying that he was the ugliest of the seven siblings. I could not believe that. 
Then later on, when I started studying these things, how things are created by your mind, right? So this is a clear indication that our perceptions can be very deceptive. Our mind can influence our perceptions. And we believe in the perceptions that this is the reality. So oftentimes, our realities are not the realities. They are how our mind deceptively creates. If this is what is the fact, if this is how it is, then the question arises whether or not, <laughs> whether or not this flower, the flower which, which you see, how can you say that what you see is true? This is the next question. Right? This is the next question. So, our perceptions, all our perceptions come under question. Whether what they, whether the information that the perceptions provide you, whether they tell you the reality, whether they are the reality, this question. Okay, now let me say you're watching a movie. You're watching a movie in a movie theater. You're watching a movie in the movie theater. When, and then the screen is here, the screen is here. And where's the movie? On the screen. And where is this movie coming from? Not from the screen. It is on the screen, but coming from the projector. Where's the projector? The projector is behind you, not in front. It's behind you. So the movie is coming from the projector, not from the screen. But it is on the screen. It is on the screen, not coming from the screen, coming from the projector. Likewise, when you look at this flower, where's the projector? Your mind is the projector. It is coming from your mind. It is there. It is not there in the mind. It is there. It is where you are seeing, but it's not coming from the object. It's coming from your mind, like the, the movie projector. Don't forget it. Okay. So this, how do we know this? Again, how do we know this? This is a question. This is so important. This is so important. How do we know this? So, anything, anything that comes to your understanding, anything that somebody shares with you, don't take them blindly. Don't take them blindly. Right? So the Buddhist approach is very different. Always make the point that what you hear, what you believe, you must be convinced about it. You must be convinced about it. So you can question your perception, whether what I'm seeing is accurate or not. So the Buddha said, the bhikshus and the wise men and women just as the goldsmith tests the purity of the gold by cutting, rubbing, and burning the gold, you should also examine my words and put them into practice, not simply because you respect me. This is the strength, this is the beauty of the teaching of the Buddha. Just as the goldsmith tests the purity of the gold by cutting, rubbing, and burning the gold, you should also examine my words and put them into practice, not simply because you respect me. This is the strength and the beauty of the Buddha's teachings. Okay, with this mind, with this mind, what we are learning now, at the moment we have to create a structure, we have to learn something. Then you have to explore this deeper to gain conviction in this. One, that things, how we see things, this flower, how we see things, this is to be put under question. But it really exists the way it appears to our mind. So, the Buddha, what we've learned so far is that things should, things, for example, the flower, things can possibly come into being by dependence, by not independently. There's nothing independently existing. Things exist by dependence. Dependence in three ways. Dependence on its causes. The flower comes into being by dependence on its earlier seeds, water, then the, the word photosynthesis, and so forth. Then the flower also comes into being by dependence on its petals, the leaves, the, the cells, then the, the nucleus, the cytoplasm, this, the, what, the mitochondria, and so forth. Then the flower comes into being, but it's really there. If you go there, you see the cells. None of the cells are flower. How many of you, how many of you agree with me or not? If you really go close to the object, you see that it's made of cells, and none of the cells are flower. And you go further, these cells are also made of molecules, the molecules, and none of the molecules is the flower. And you go further, and the molecules are made of atoms, and none of the atoms is the flower, right? 
So what do you see now? On this level, what do you see? I'm ju I just see the atoms. And where's the flower? The flower disappears. You're getting it? So, but when you come out of that, again you start feeling seeing a flower. As though like there's one entity. In actuality, when you go too deep, you see that it's just atoms. But dependence on these atoms, then your mind starts seeing a flower. Your mind serves as a projector to project a flower on the base of these atoms. None of the atoms are flower, yet your mind projects a flower. Right? What is really the old object is just the atoms. Even the atoms are questionable. Right? Even the atoms are also questionable. Okay, so from this, what come, we, we come to know is that this flower, on the gross level, this flower comes into being but depends on its causes like the seed, water, manure, and so forth. One. Number two, this flower comes into being but depends on the, its parts like the petals, the leaves, and so forth. Number two. Number three, but depends on these, these parts and the atoms and so forth, then your mind imputes a flower. Your mind creates a feeling for flower. Just as this mother, oh, this my, my child is so, my child is so soft and tender and, you know, gentle. So this is simply mother's projection. Likewise, I'm, I'm projected like a mind projects the flower there. While going there, it's just the atoms and not the atoms of flower. No is the flower there, but your mind imbues the flower, right? So now we see that even this flower comes into being by dependence on three different factors. One, what? Depends on its causes and conditions. Number two, depends on its parts. Number three, depends on the mind. Okay, keep this in mind. So with this, when we see that this flower comes into being by dependence, what is opposite of dependence? Independence. When you say that this flower comes into being by dependence, implicitly you are rejecting the independence of the flower. You are rejecting the independent existence of the flower. That is rejected. You're getting it? Okay. Whereas, when you look at this flower, how does it appear to you? Okay. When you look at this flower, how does this flower appear to you? Right? My question is, how does it appear to you? Meaning that, oh, this flower, oh, my mind is projector. And it projects it. Right? Or, no, no, it's there and coming to my mind. Which of the two? It's there and coming to my mind. Like the movie is there and coming from the screen. This is deception. From there and coming to mind. This is no. From there, what is there? If there is something there, it's just atoms. And none of the atoms are flower. And from distance, your mind sees a flower. Your mind imputes a flower. That's it. When you look at it, you don't see it like the painter. The painter who painted the ghost by himself. He painted that. And after two years coming there, seeing the ghost coming from there. Not that you have painted it. It's coming from the object, not from the subject. Right? Likewise, when you look at this flower, you see this from the object or from your subject? From your mind as the subject and projector, creating it, or from the object is coming to you? Which way it appears to you? It appears as objectively existent, from the object. This is deception. Objective existence, independent existence, this is deception. Right? So, now look. Seeing this flower as independently, objectively real, like seeing the dream goes as objectively real, out there, objectively real, that frightens you. That frightens you. The moment you wake up, what's the difference? You realize that the, the dream goes is not from the object, it's from the subject, from the mind. The moment you realize that it's from the, the subject, then you see that from the object is empty. The fear dissolves. Right? Okay, so with this, with this, with this, the Buddha came, came on this earth to teach us that everything is like dream. You just wake up, you realize that your dream goes, it's not real it goes, it's coming from your mind. Right? Which means that the Buddha came on this earth to teach us that everything is like a dream, just as a dream comes into being by the power of your mind. Everything is coming into being by the power of three different factors, and particularly your mind. Okay, so this is what four. The, the Buddha Shakyamuni appeared. When you say that it comes from the mind, then from the object side, it's empty. Then, the moment you come to know that it's from the object side, it's empty, you are working out. You are the waking one. Okay, stanza 1, page 52. He who speaks on the basis of seeing, this makes him a knower and teacher on excel. 
and bow to you, O conqueror, you who saw dependent origination in Tade. So this, this text, as I said earlier, was written by the author, Lama Tsongkhapa. After realizing this ultimate reality, after waking up from this sleep of ignorance, so we can see the ultimate reality. If it is coming from a mind, nothing from the object. When he realized that, then he was so fascinated. Who taught this? A Buddhist came on this earth. He taught this. He did not say that the Tibetan, the Tibetan master taught it. He said that Buddhist Akhamani taught it. And this Buddhist Akhamani is the teacher of all the traditions: Theravada Buddhism, Chinese Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, all Buddhism. So this teacher taught. Okay, so he who speaks, he referring to the Buddha Shakyamuni, he who speaks speaks about this speaks about this subjective existence, emptiness of the objective existence, how everything's dreamlike, on the basis of seeing, on the basis of his own experience of seeing things as dreamlike. Seeing, this makes him, the Buddha Shakyamuni, a real knower, someone who knows the reality, and someone who who is the real teacher of the real ultimate reality, who is so unexcelled, who is so unexcelled. I bow to you, you, Buddha Shakyamuni, O conqueror, conqueror meaning the one who has conquered, the one who has conquered all the misperceptions, the one who has conquered all the misperceptions and the ignorance. O conqueror, you who, you who saw dependent origination and taught it, meaning that things come into the being not independently, not objectively, but by dependence. This is what he taught. Number two, whatever the generations they are in the world. Now look, Bodhisattva Khamani, this young prince Da, in his palace, Kapitavastu, in his palace, he was so sad. See, misery is everywhere, and being in the kingdom, they, his father had to take care of all his subjects. There were so many wars going between the, the nation, the, between the kingdoms. He could see soldiers injured, dying, and the soldiers' wives, children, they become, the children becoming the, say, semi-orphan, and the wives, what, widows. And he was so paranoid, he was so sad, so demoralized, that this is very sad. World. I must look for an answer. I must look for a solution to help all these beings. They should not suffer like this. They should not suffer like this. This is what came to the mind of this young prince Da. And then he left the palace in search of the answer. So finally, after six years, he got answer by waking up from the sleep of ignorance. Then he woke up. He woke up from the sleep of ignorance. Wow. All these miseries, they are simply the dream. Now the sentient beings, they should also wake up from the sleep, from the sleep of ignorance, that they don't have to suffer anymore. Right? Okay. So then he realized, number two, whatever degenerations, whatever miseries they are in the world, the root of all these is ignorance, sleep of ignorance. Right? Sleep of ignorance is responsible, say, the fear of the dream ghost. It's because of what? This fear is because of because of, the, because of not knowing the dream, dream goes as the dream goes, thinking that the dream goes as the dream goes. This sleep, this sleep is responsible for deceiving you. Whatever degenerations or the miseries there are in the world, the root of all these is ignorance. What ignorance? Self-grasping ignorance. Think, seeing things as, what is meant by self-grasping? What is this, this ignorance? Self-grasping ignorance. What does it mean by self-grasping ignorance? Ignorance which views things as objectively real. Which views things as objective real as opposed to as opposed to dreamlike nature. Which views things as objectively real as opposed to dreamlike nature. You taught that it is dependent origination, the seeing of which will undo this ignorance. If you see dependent origination, so how will this ignorance un be undone? How this ignorance, which is responsible for all the miseries, right? Okay, say for example, say for example, okay, in the dream, someone auctions a car, in your dream, somebody auctions a car, and you are, you are desperately looking for a car, if possible, Mercedes car, 
the Ricci. <laughs> new, new Mercedes car, the Ricci. And it so happened that in the dream, someone's auctioning a, a new Mercedes car. You know, in the dream. Mercedes of BMW. Let's <laughs> say BMW. Okay, so someone auctioning. And then it is just one thousand sing dollars. Start in there. Right? So in there. <laughs> and you're looking for a very cheap one. Very cheap and new, brand new BMW car. You're looking for that. Brand new, but very cheap. Okay, so you, you, you're ready to give one thousand sing dollars. And the person says, one thousand sing dollars, start from there. And you are so happy you raised your hand. Thousands of people raised their hands. <laughs> Thousands of people raised their hands, right? And then someone says, okay, I'll give two thousand sing dollars, right? And then you become so angry, you don't want to pay more than one thousand dollars. You become so angry, right? Because one thousand dollars, then you become so excited, right? First you see the BMW car, there's no car actually, it's your dream. <laughs> and in the dream, you're deceived by the, your own dream and see there's a real BMW car. One, ignorance. So this ignorance leads you to, leads you to have a craving for this. I'm so fortunate that there's auctioning going BMW, fresh BMW car for $1,000. Okay, so desire arises, this affliction. So this affliction is given rise to by the ignorance, seeing this dream BMW as the real BMW car, right? Okay, this ignorance gives rise to the attachment. And this attachment, when somebody says $2,000, you are not ready to give $2,000. Now you, there's no chance that you will get it, right? You, then you become so angry. So attachment gives rise to anger, right? And then when the other person get it, right? In the night you may go to, you go to fight with that person or put down the person, right? The fine. With the fine, you end up in prison. <laughs> and prison is not a good place for you to stay, right? So look, what is the chain of this misery? So first started by what? Believing the dream, believing the dream BMW as the real BMW. This ignorance, one. Wow. It started. This is the trigger of all the chain of miseries. From this, the attachment arises. And attachment, anger. Attachment, anger fall under the afflictions. So this affliction made you to fight with this person. Fighting is the action, karma. So this karma entered you in misery. Misery is samsara. In prison is samsara, right? So this samsara, the miseries, they're all given rise to by the act of fighting. This act of fighting is the karma. This karma come into being because of the emotion, negative emotions. This negative emotions come into being because of the wrong perception. What's the wrong perception? Perceiving the dream BMW car as a real BMW car, very cheap. <laughs> the fresh BMW car, very cheap. So that misperception leads the chain of miseries coming to you, right? Okay. Now, if you don't want to end up in prison, what should you do? You should have. You should not have fought. How you should have stopped fighting it? You should not have the craving, anger, craving should not be there. How should have stopped the anger and craving so far? You should, have, you should not have misperceived the dream BMW car as a real BMW car. So we see that ignorance has to be cut. If this ignorance is cut, dream BMW, oh, this is just a dream BMW car, right? It is deceiving me. If this is what you think, then the attachment will not come. Anger will not arise. Then even if somebody gets it, oh, you are getting a dream BMW car. <laughs> Right? So I don't, I don't care, I don't mind, right? You will not fight with the person. If you don't fight with the person, you will not end up in prison, right? So this is how we are doing, how, the, how we end up in the prison of samsara and how we can possibly come out of the samsara. So this is how we have to know with this example. Okay, so stanza two. Whatever degenerations there are in the world, all these degenerations or the miseries there are in the world, the root of all these is Ignorance. You come to know how the ignorance is the root? Root of this is the ignorance. You taught that it is dependent origination. This BMW car, dream BMW car, came into being by dependence on a mind. Your mind has created it. It's not objectively real. It's not a real BMW car. It is just a car coming to you, coming to being by your mind, a dreaming mind. So 
you thought that it is dependent origination. It comes with being by dependence on your mind that the dream be to be a bit of regard comes to the being. The seeing of which, if you see this dependent origination, that it is not objectively there. It comes to the being by dependence on the mind, the seeing of which will undo this ignorance. This ignorance, believing that there's a real being to recall. This misperception will be undone by seeing dependent origination. Number three. So how can an intelligent person not comprehend that this part of dependent origination is the essential point of your teaching? So the very purpose for the Buddha Shakyamuni appearing on this earth is to teach dependent origination and teach the emptiness of objective existence. Empty to teach dependent origination and teach the emptiness of objective slash independent existence. So this is the hard core of the Buddha's teaching. This is the most important part of the Buddha's teachings. And how come that the in how come how can an intelligent person not comprehend that this part of dependent origination is the essential point of your teaching, is the main point of your teaching, right? So from this, what is the message that we are getting? If you really think that you are Buddhist, if you really think that you are following the Buddha's teachings, you have to understand dependent origination in these three levels. Without understanding this, you don't know who this Buddha is. At the most, you may know oh, he's once a prince Siddhar. There are so many princes, right, whose names we have forgotten now. It's not because that he was a prince that he's remembered today. It is because of something so unique that this prince taught that he's remembered today. That he is revered today. What is that? Dependent origination and the emptiness of independent existence. Uh, four. This being so, who will find O oh, Savior? Savior meaning the Buddha. The Buddha who taught this dependent origination and thus he saved the beings from and drowning into the miseries of samsara. This being so, who will find O oh, Savior a more wonderful way to praise you than to praise you for having taught this origination through dependence? Because we see that, okay, say if you are, say if you, okay, uh, the students, what is your main subject, what is your major subject? Nursing. Nursing, what is your major subject? Engineering. Engineering, what is your major subject? Business. Business, what is your major subject? Physiotherapy. Physiotherapy, what is your major subject? Construction. Construction, okay. <laughs> yeah. Not the construction, she is the, the overseer, what is it? The managing the, the people who are in this construction. <laughs> no, no, no. All engineers, all architects will go under her. No, no, no. In case, in case any engineer or architect don't think that I'm the boss, they should look, they should look they should to you. Okay, so, and then when I was a child, Particularly when I was class 9, 10. What subject I was so addicted to? Physics. When I class 9, 10, 11, 12, four years before I graduated high school, the most, the subject which I was so fond of is physics. And because of which, if somebody gives me, let's say, the, I have my friend, in those days, the twins going abroad, very less, very less. And my friend, he was taken to America by his parents. So my friend, who was, I think, age-wise, maybe one or two years older than me, then he left from America and constantly eat. Not email, there no, there no, there was no email. So I, I sent one a letter to him the, for me to receive the letter back. If I'm very lucky, I'll get it for one month. If I send a letter to my friend to America, the reply that I'll get will be only after one month. That too, if I'm lucky. Because it takes like one month. 15 days there, and then he will read it, and if he's lazy, <laughs> if he's lazy, he will not send the reply right there. It may take another one, two, three days. Then, coming back, it will take another 15 days. Right? So, he was to ask me, Dorji, what can I send you for, uh, send you from America? So the only thing that's always coming to my mind was a big poster of Albert Einstein. <laughs> and still it did not come. <laughs> yeah, already 40 years in you know, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 
Yeah, he offered to send me, don't see what you want from the man. But big post of Alvarez time. I, you know, who had this in a meal? I don't know whether the meal is lost on the road. Still, it does not come. Even now, I, I did not have that. Okay, so why are we craving for this picture of Albert Einstein? If there is, if instead of this Albert Einstein, if he sends me a picture of Richard Gere, I'll take it out. I would rather have Albert Einstein's picture. Why? Why? Because I, for me, that makes the greatest sense to me, physics, not the artistic. Physics makes the greatest sense to me. Likewise, for you, what, is the, what makes the greatest sense? Freedom from suffering, or physics, or say the, the Michael Jackson, <laughs> which would make, which is of the greatest interest to you? Freedom from suffering, or physics, or Michael Jackson, or whatever. What do you think is, that makes the greatest sense to you? Freedom from suffering. For freedom from suffering, what is the most important thing? The wisdom of emptiness. That's the most important thing. So therefore, stanza four says, this being so, who will find O Savior a more wonderful way to praise you than to praise you for having taught this origination through dependence, right? The Buddha, the Buddha has so many qualities, like the middle powers, then say he, that he has such a physical beauty, physical elegance. The Buddha's physical elegance, the description is just amazing. The description is just amazing. And physical beauty is one of his characteristics. And then he's so good in the, the mundane arts, like archery, horse riding, all these things. He's simply mastered. There was no, no one could compete with him. There are so many good qualities. Of all these good qualities, if you are interested in archery, then you will praise the Buddha Shakyamuni for his skill of archery. <laughs> Whereas, if you are interested in liberation, then you will praise the Buddha Shakyamuni for what? For his having taught that dependent origination. Right? So, stanza four. This being so, who will find, O Savior, a more wonderful way to praise you? Praise you? Them to praise you for having taught the dependent origination instead of being physically very attractive, instead of being having mastered in archery, having mastered in horse riding, having mastered in many other skills. Sense of five. Whatsoever it depends on conditions, that is devoid of intrinsic existence. Now the question is, what does it mean by dependent origination? What does it mean by dreamlike nature? Whatsoever it depends on conditions, that is devoid of intrinsic existence. Say, Dependence, opposite of, what is the opposite of dependence? Independence. Independence, intrinsicality, independence, intrinsicality, objectively, they all mean the same. So when you say whatever depends on conditions, when things come to being by depends on conditions, then it's an indication that it is devoid of intrinsic existence. It is devoid of objective existence. So when I say that this flower, this flower is mine. When I say this flower is mine, what did I say? No, no, no. Oh, when I say this flower is mine, explicitly I'm saying that this flower is mine. But implicitly I'm saying something else. I'm saying that this is not yours. Likewise, when we say that this flower is dependently originated, Explicitly, I'm saying that this flower exists dependently. Implicitly, I'm saying that this flower does not exist independently. Right? Implicitly, I'm saying that this flower does not exist independently, that it does not exist intrinsically. Intrinsically, intrinsic, independence, objective existence, they all mean the same. So it says, whatsoever it depends on conditions, number five, whatsoever it depends on conditions that is devoid of intrinsic existence. When you say something comes to be by dependence, which means it is empty of intrinsic existence, it is devoid of objective existence or independent existence. What excellent instruction can there be more amazing than this proclamation? Number six, by grasping at it, at it is referring to dependent origination. Okay. Okay, let's see. Okay. Mm. Okay. Let's 
say the school is the school is the at the end of the year at the end of the year the school gives the certificate to whatever your achievements. And one of the certificate is the certificate of the best student of the of the school of the year. The best student. Best student what, what best student? In education or say overall mannerism, studies, charisma, overall. Okay. So what, what is that certificate? Certificate for the best student. Best student means someone who's very decent, very kind, very knowledgeable, overall. Right? Now, okay, see then, okay, this this is awarded to I say Miss Miss A, girl A, girl A, and then uh, girl B says no 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 I deserve it, I deserve this certificate she doesn't deserve it right she's girl B starts fighting does she deserve the certificate the fact that she's fighting if you're really the best student she will not fight for these certificates the, the fact that you're fighting which means you do not deserve that. Although you're claiming that this certificate belongs to me. Likewise, this certificate which is like the dependent origination. So there are two groups. There are two groups. One, say the Buddha taught dependent origination. Things are all dependent originated. And particularly there's one sutra. There's one sutra. Rice Seedly Sutra. Rice Seedly Sutra. And it is translated into English by 84,000 translation group. 84,000 translation group. Okay, Rai Siddhi Sutra. And if you Google search 84,000 translation, then you can download that. Vishnisha, is it available at the moment? Very soon. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, very soon. This, uh, this will be, you can download that from the website 84,000 translation, which is an amazing, amazing work, amazing project. 4,000 project. So under this, so many all these sutras are to be translated in English. So, in praise of so, rice seedling sutra. So this is what the Buddha taught directly about dependent origination. So the Buddha taught dependent origination. Now there's two groups within Buddhists, right? Two groups. So, one group says that, oh, Buddha taught dependent origination because things are dependent originated. Things should exist. They originate. Because things should exist, things should exist independently. Okay, one group of the one group, one group of the followers of the Buddha said that Buddha taught dependent origin, that things exist as dependent origination. You getting it? Because the Buddha said that things are dependent originated, things should be originated. Things should exist. Because things exist, existence and objective existence mean the same for the first group. The second group says, no, Buddha taught dependent origination. Dependent origination means things originate by dependence, not independently, by dependence. So therefore, the Buddha, when the Buddha taught that things exist dependently, Buddha is saying there is no independent existence. There is no objective existence. A object comes into being, originate, by dependence on the mind. There's no, it's subjective, it's not objective. So two groups. Okay, a six. No, a five. No, six. By grasping at it, it, re it referred to what? Dependent origination, the concept of dependent origination. By grasping at this dependent origination, the chantish, the chantish meaning, the one who is less competent to understand the Buddha's Buddha's ultimate intent. The childish strengthened bondage to extreme views, meaning that the Buddha taught dependent origination, so therefore things should originate. If things originate, things should exist. If things exist, existence and objective existence mean the same. So, so therefore things should exist objectively. Right? So then there they believe in the objective existence strengthens. So self-grasping ignorance is strengthened. They, re, re, they, um, they, they reinforce, they reinforce the dream. Hey, don't wake up. 
keep staying in the dream. They reinforce the dream by reinforcing the self-grasping ignorance. So as you strengthen the for self-grasping ignorance, what happens? Then the afflictions strengthen. As the afflictions strengthen, what happens? Then the co contaminant commas multiply. With contaminant commas multiplied and intensified, what happens? Miseries intensified and become even more severe. So, so these childish who wrongly interpret the Buddha's, Buddha's teaching, Buddha's teaching, what they did is by grasping at it, the childish strengthened bondage to extreme views. What is extreme view? The view believing that, okay, extreme views at the middle way. Extreme views, the view or the belief that the extreme, the extreme of nihilism, extreme of absolutism, extreme of nihilism, extreme of absolutism. You're getting it? The two extremes. The two extremes. Extreme of absolutism means things exist independently. This is one extreme. Other says nothing exists. Think extreme of nihilism. These are the two extremes, right? And if you believe that dependent origination means Things exist objectively. Things exist objectively means you turn towards absolutism. So the extreme of absolutism increases. It is reinforced. By grasping at it, the child strengthens bondage to the extreme views. For the wise, whereas for the wise, for the wise, dependent origination means things come into being by dependence on three ways. Dependent in three ways. Dependent on causes and depends on paths. It depends on mind. So when you say it depends on the mind, it depends on the subjective mind. Implicitly it is saying that there's no objective existence, it's subjective, it's not objective. So for the wise, this very fact, this very fact of dependent origination, understand that this very fact of dependent origination is the doorway to cut free from the net of elaborations of samsara. So samsara is cut. You're free from samsara. Seven. Since this teaching is not seen elsewhere, so now look, we have to know the history. We have to know the Bible of the Buddha Shakyamuni. So the our teacher, the compassionate teacher Buddha Shakyamuni, what he did was that that he was a young prince Siddhartha, young prince Siddhartha, and then he was look for the solution to the miseries of the sentient beings. Then what did he do? He left the palace. Then he went in search of, say, search of the solution, and the solution. He has to get it from a teacher. So he went in search of teacher. And he first met the teacher, the first teacher, Alamakara, the first teacher. And the first teacher met him. And then very soon, whatever instruction was given by the first teacher, he reached the same level as the teacher, very soon. And then he asked for more instructions. And the teacher said, no, you have already reached the same level as I reached. Then the Buddha said, no, still I did not get the answer. Right? So the Buddha went in search of the next teacher. And he met the second teacher, Udrika. He met the second teacher, Udrika. So being the second teacher, second teachers, the experience was much higher than the first one. Then he received teaching from the second teacher. And within very few days, again very soon, the Buddha reached the same level as the second teacher. Then the Buddha asked for more instructions. Then the second teacher says, No, I have nothing more. So now you have to reach the same level as I, what I reached. And it was, no, I still have not found the answer to all the questions, all the, the miseries of the sentient beings. So then, um, then the Buddha left, and finally what he found, he found this wisdom of dependent origination, the wisdom of emptiness of objective existence. This is what he found over six years of practice. Okay, stanza seven. So which means that this teaching which this Buddha Shakyamuni found, it was non-existent before the Buddha Shakyamuni. Non-existence amongst the teachers who were there before the Buddha Shakyamuni. So since this teaching is not seen, seen elsewhere, elsewhere it was for the first time on this earth taught by the Buddha Shakyamuni. You alone, you alone are the teacher, the teacher of this ultimate path. Like calling a fox, so they say the, the contemporaries of the Buddha Shakyamuni, contemporaries of the Buddha Shakyamuni, like following a fox a line for a tirtika, it would be like a word of flattery. So finally, the what the purpose of the teaching is what? 
that the being should be happy, that the sentient being should be happy. And what is the ultimate happiness? To be free from miseries. And how to be free from miseries? That the ignorance should be cut. How to cut the ignorance? By teaching the wisdom of emptiness. So without knowing what is the wisdom of emptiness, how can you be the teacher? So therefore, Buddha Shakyamuni for the first time taught this on this earth, before which it was truly absent. Eight. So therefore, now the Buddha Shakyamuni is revered, is the Lama Tsongkhapa, the author. He's seeing this emptiness himself. He was so amazed by the Buddha Shakyamuni. Then he praised the Buddha Shakyamuni, saying that wondrous teacher, wondrous refuge. Wonderful teacher, because you are so wonderful teacher, who taught this final panacea, final panacea to heal all the problems, and wondrous refuge. By seeking your guidance, by seeking your guidance, I got the refuge. I'm protected. That I'm able to eliminate the seven rasa ignorance, and because of which all the miseries stop, I'm protected from the miseries. You are the refuge. Wonderful speaker, and how you spoke about emptiness, ultimate reality, is true, a very skilled understanding of the dependent origin is a wondrous speaker, a wondrous savior, and you save the sentient beings by teaching this concept. I pay homage to that teacher who taught well dependent origination. Number nine, to help heal sentient beings, benefactor, you have taught the peerless reason to ascertain emptiness, the heart of the teaching. So heart of the teaching is to say that wake up from the sleep of ignorance, wake up. Wake up sleep with ignorance. In what way waking up helps you? By waking up, you will see that the dream goals is not a real goal. By waking up, you will realize that the dream goals is empty of being a real goal. You're getting it? By waking up, what happens? In what way it helps you to, to free you from the fear of the, the ghost? That you realize that the dream goals is empty of being a real ghost. Right? So the emptiness. Emptiness that the dream goes empty of being a real ghost, that everything is empty of being objective existence, this is the heart essence of the Buddha's teaching. The end, this teaching is the heart, the main of the teaching, teaching on emptiness, and how to get there, how to get there is through the, through the means of dependent origination. Okay, emptiness, emptiness, does not mean nothingness, your five points. Emptiness doesn't mean nothingness. So you see that emptiness, you should understand by means of the dependent origination. So how de understand dependent origination will take you to understand emptiness. Emptiness doesn't mean nothingness. It is a short form of emptiness of independent existence. It is a short form of emptiness of independent existence. Number two, emptiness of independent existence means, emptiness of independent existence means there is no independent existence. Number three, there is no independent existence means all existences are by dependence. Number four, all existences by, are by dependence means dependent origination. Number five, so emptiness doesn't mean nothingness, it means dependent origination. So through understanding dependent origination, then you will get to emptiness. And dependent origination, we can see it very often, we, can, we see it very commonly, right? By say by 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 dependence on fighting with someone, by dependence on fighting with someone, you the you ending up in prison you ending up in prison originates. <laughs> dependent origination, right? By by not studying this emptiness, by not studying emptiness, by dependence on not studying emptiness, your self-class ignorance keeps proliferating. That is originated. By dependence on studying emptiness, by dependence on studying emptiness, the ignorance, diminishing of the ignorance originated. Dependent originated. This is something so common and seen. By dependence on not giving chocolate to the small child, the crying of the child originates. <laughs> yeah, this, this is how we see dependent originated in our lives. So common, so common. So by seeing dependent origination, then you, so therefore there is no independent existence. Therefore there is no objective existence. Therefore things are empty of independent existence. Therefore things are empty of independent existence and objective existence. Okay. Okay, so now we see that 
seeing things as empty of objective existence, emptiness of objective existence, this is the ultimate heart essence of the Buddha's teaching. Now, this teaching is so profound. Empty <coughs> is so profound that the Buddha Shakyamuni, the Buddha Shakyamuni, after becoming enlightened, where? Become enlightened where? Under the Bodhi tree in Bodh Gaya. Under the Bodhi tree in Bodh Gaya, he became enlightened. What's the purpose of him becoming enlightened? So that he can go to help the sentient beings by teaching by teaching the ultimate reality of the emptiness of objective existence. Now, after achieving enlightenment, he did not <coughs> teach. He remained silent for 49 days. He remained silent for 49 days. Within 49 days, he could have taught so many beings, but he did not teach. Right? <coughs> then the, the kings of the celestial beings, Brahma, Indra, right? They could sense that Prince Siddhartha achieved enlightenment, the full awakened, was full awakened and became enlightened on the planet Earth, under the Bodhi tree in Bodh Gaya. They could sense it. And yet for 49 days they sensed that no, no one is being held by this Prince Siddhartha as with the Gautama Buddha. No one is being held. They become so anxious, they become so worried. Then the two kings of the celestial being, they descended on the Earth. And then they made prostrations to the enlightened one, Buddha Shakyamuni. Oh, the venerable enlightened one, fully awakened one. Why? Sentient beings are suffering. And you become enlightened for the sake of sentient beings. Now that you have become enlightened and you are not helping sentient beings, you are not giving teachings to sentient beings, please don't remain silent. Please turn the wheel of Dharma. This was me, the request me. Then the Buddha said, then the Buddha, this, the Gautama Buddha, the awakened one, said, this stanza, in Sanskrit, no, maybe in uh, Pali, whatever. So in Tibetan, it is Sashi to the Sudumache, to sit the way she she coined, so the shake of whole, many of them, and I will not never chant. This is the Tibetan version. So the Buddha said that this path, this reality which I've discovered, it is so profound, it is so peaceful, it is devoid of elaborations, it is of the nature of the Kailai. Non composite. Such a nectar like truth is what I've discovered. Finding no one who can fathom the depth of this teaching, I'd rather retire into the woods in silence. This is what the Buddha said. So, therefore, then the Brahma and Indra, the kings of the spiritual beings, they made more persuasions to the Buddha, please don't remain silent, please keep, uh, please turn the will of Dharma. Then the Buddha went to Sarna to turn the first wheel of the Dharma, right? Okay, so with this, with this we see that the, the sense of mind, to help heal sentient beings, oh, is it sense of mind? Yes, to help heal sentient beings. Benefactor, you have taught the peerless reason to ascertain emptiness, the heart of the teaching. So the, the, the peerless reason, what reason? The peerless reason of dependent origination. The peerless reason of dependent origination to understand to understand, to ascertain the emptiness concept. Emptiness, to wake up. Emptiness concept. Okay. A sense of ten, then we'll stop here. This way of dependent origination, those who perceive it as contradictory or as unestablished, how can they comprehend your system? Okay. We ended up in a very technical part. <laughs> <laughs> to explain it, again, we'll take another 15 minutes. <laughs> uh, tomorrow, okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Okay, please turn to please turn to uh, page three zero six. Okay, that's three zero nine. Three zero nine. Three zero nine. We will do the shorter version of the definition prayer. Shorter version. Okay. Um, may this light of the Bodhisattva, which shares others more than oneself, may this light of the wisdom of emptiness flourish in all ten directions in the minds of all two sentient beings, so that the self-grasping ignorance and the self-centered attitude, the two demons,
are exterminated from the minds of all the other sentient beings altogether, and they experience the bodies of happiness eternally. May all the great teachers, all the great teachers who teach the wisdom of emptiness, who teach the unconditional love, like His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and all the great, the, the great saints, the present saints existing wherever they are, and may they live long, and that they wish us all fulfilled spontaneously. And may I personally dedicate the merits to scattered, that each one of you, through concerted effort, be able to see, be able to soon see the dawn of the wisdom of emptiness within yourself, and the book, the, the, the light of the Polish within yourself, and that each one of you becomes, becomes such a reliable guide to lead all the human sentient beings from the darkness of miseries to the light of enlightenment as soon as possible. May the teaching of the Bodhisattva flourish in all ten directions, and may the teaching of the Vishnu Mantinus flourish in all ten directions in the minds of dear Mother Sanjay beings present in the future. Okay, with that in mind, let's turn to page 309. With the wish to free all beings, all souls of refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, until I reach the enlightenment, inspired by wisdom and compassion, today in the Buddha's presence, I attend the divine full awakening for the benefit of all Sanjay beings. I go for refuge to the true gem, I profess the negative that is in the I rejoice in the virtues of all the beings, I go the affection for the Lord. As long as faith remains, as long as virtue remains, remains, until then I have to remain to dispel the misery of the The path of the union of emptiness and compassion is used to explain by the protective of Dharma and the beings of the story. You are the lotus of the Dharma, you are the lotus of the Dharma, you are the lotus of the Dharma, you are the lotus of the Dharma. May the operations of evil thoughts and deeds of the negative forces of humans and non-humans who have a merit to provide their prayers against the teachings of the Buddhas be truly vanished through the power of the truth of the three jewels. Throughout my future of our times, now always be guided by our ministry and be able to uphold the Dharma in general and the teachings of independent religions in particular, even at the cost of life.